Hello and welcome to ILTV's Elections Arena. I'm Aaron Porras and for our topics in the ring today, rocket sirens blare across the southern half of the country, party leaders Benjamin Netanyahu and Benny Gantz inch closer to a unity agreement, and the EU's High Court of Justice issues a troubling ruling. But here to discuss is columnist for Newsweek and editor of HistoryCentral.com, Mark Schulman. And on the other side, political strategist and director of English operations for the New Right Party, or Hayamina Khadash, Jeremy Salton. Thank you both so much again for coming in today. Uh, it's a pretty crazy day out there, so uh, it is. I really appreciate that you came here. Uh, but let's talk about why it's so crazy. Israelis are sitting by the nearest shelters on Tuesday, as well over 160 rockets and counting have been fired at Israel from Gaza, towards uh, all the way from Gaza to Tel Aviv. And the attacks follow the overnight assassination of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror group's leader in Gaza, Baha Abu al Atta. Uh, he was uh, reportedly planning an imminent attack, by the way, and has been linked to hundreds of attacks on Israeli civilians spanning over a decade. But now the Islamic Jihad group is threatening war, with Hamas offering to help, and the IDF is preparing for at least several days of continued violence. So to begin, do you think it was worth it, Mark, the, okay. this, this assassination? Okay, so there are two parts to this. First of all, my own view, which people would be surprised at, is I think we should have had a policy from years ago that for every rocket that lands or gets fired from Gaza, we kill someone from Hamas. That was my view, and I still believe that. I believe we have to kill any ro one rocket, we kill one person. Hamas, Jihad, Islami, I don't care, I believe in that. So that's number one. So my view is very radical on one side of that. Was this worth it now? That's a question. I mean, in other words, we have to understand the fact that targeted killings do work to some extent. Will it make a big difference? In other words, will he be replaced by somebody else? He'll certainly be replaced by somebody else. Well, he's been um, he's been hailed as like this maverick because of his ties to Iran. So well, maybe taking him out. Well, does that's the question. I mean, he's, he's a maverick because of his ties with Iran. Will anyone else have the same ties with Iran? Probably because of the Iranian interest to keep the jihad Islamic firing at us and creating problems for us. So it's not because he's such an expert on Iran that he's, his relations were. It's in the Iranian interest to have strong relations with somebody in that organization. So killing him, I mean, he's an evil person. I have no problem with the fact that we killed him. <laughs> uh, the question of the matter is, is the timing right? Should we have done it? Should we wait for a government? All these are open questions. But the reality is, um, you know, it cost us a lot of money. You know, the fact of the matter is the decision today, which I was surprised about, at least early in the morning, to say that people should not go to work today in the Tel Aviv area. They changed it later, but by then everyone was staying home. It was too late to, to go back on that. And we talk about the cost of elections. It basically cost the cost of half an election today, cost the Israeli economy just by the fact that we announced and decided to do that. So, listen, I'm not going to say it wasn't worth it. I'm not going to say it was worth it. Time will tell. Um, I think we just need to have a policy that we keep to. Jeremy? Yeah, it's worth it. You take out a arch terrorist, it's worth it. And, and again, this is a situation of not, uh, yes, for sure, this was a decision that was made 10 days ago. You can, if you want, call it a targeted killing. But this is a guy who is in the middle of preparing and planning terrorist attacks that he was planning to do, as far as we know, perhaps even this week. So this is a ticking bomb scenario. And when you're talking about a ticking bomb, you need to go ahead and make sure the bomb explodes on the terrorist and not on the people that he wants to blow up. So, so it was 100% worth it. Of course, yes, there are costs. There are costs politically. There are costs economically. But when you're able to take out the head of the Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, that is a win. You take it, and for sure you do it when you know that there is a threat that is imminent to make sure that you close that before it's too late. Now, another thing that, that uh, you both kind of touched upon just now was the policy of targeted assassinations, mm -hmm. which Israel has officially given up on uh, for the last few years, but there's a lot of talk that this might be, uh, you know, a return of sorts to that policy. Do you think that that's what this is, or do you kind of take the government at its word saying, listen, this was a preeminent uh, kind of thing that we had to do in order to preempt uh, Look, the, 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 there's no question that by not having targeted assassinations and by every time that there was a rocket fire, we bombed empty buildings, basically that we were losing a little bit of our deterrence, to say the least. You have to have some sort of deterrence. I mean, every time there, we, there would be um, rockets on Steyrot or wherever it might be, and we heard, oh, Tzahal bombed all these targets, no one was wounded. Well, I, you know, if no one was wounded, it means we were hitting empty buildings once again. Hitting empty buildings really doesn't cost them anything. And the fact of the matter, we obviously weren't hitting missiles, because they seem to have plenty of missiles. So whatever, whatever reason, we have not been hitting missiles when we've been attacking. So, so you the, think we're not doing enough, even now? 
Well, I don't know enough of doing now. Forget even right now, because right now I can't tell what we're doing exactly. But generally speaking, I don't think we did enough. And that's a whole other question of what our policy is towards Gaza, whether we want Hamas to still be there or not be there. We all agree that Islamic Jihad is the worst. And so we can all agree about that, and we all can agree that, you know, anybody who's a member of the Islamic Jihad needs to be taken care of as best as we could. You know, I sometimes look, it's going to sound terrible, but I look at the funeral and I said, hmm, that looks like a really good target, target zone for me, all <laughs> members of Islamic Jihad. I mean, what, what exactly are we doing? I mean, look, these are people who are sworn enemies of us. It's not even Hamas who can make the argument that they're a quasi-government, they're taking care of the people. Without them, we'd have to have people in there taking care of, they're providing schools, they're providing food. They, do, they have a positive function. Whether we like them or hate them, they do provide some positive function inside of Gaza. Islamic Jihad is there for one per, per reason and one reason only, to attack and kill us. So as far as I'm concerned, every single member of them is a legitimate target for us. You know, uh, I, was, I was here last week, and uh, on the other side, I, I had an opponent who told me that, uh, you know, everything is fine with Gaza and that uh, we don't need to worry about the timing. I said, everything is about the timing. We have to do things when it's on our initiative and not when we are responding to what they are starting up. I think what we see right now, if we're looking at the day and how it is really playing out, We've caught Islamic Jihad off guard. They are now responsive. We are the ones that are initiating. We are striking strategic places within the Strip. We are winning here. This is the type of policies that we want to see. This is how you resolve the Gaza issue militarily. Except for that, keep one thing in mind, though, and now I'll we'll, we'll disagree. I know for a fact that the policy of the government, though, has been to sort of prop up Hamas. And so that's one of the major issues. So this works well because it's Islamic Jihad who's a threat to Hamas as well. But we've made, the Israeli government has made the strategic decision to make sure that Hamas stays in power. I remember in the last round of uh, attacks when we had 1,700 rockets against Israel, that was like a, it's January year approximately, uh, you know, I sat on a table like this with a former member of Knesset from Likud, and he basically said, well, we don't want to take a chance that the Hamas will fall from power because then the Palestinian Authority might come back into power, and that would be a problem from a different perspective. Mm. So well, the reality is... I, I think the fear is more maybe Islamic Jihad would take power. Well, but, but, power. So again, if you're dealing, as we are right now, we're not dealing with Hamas in this operation. We're dealing specifically with Islamic Jihad. Hamas, for the most part, there are a few incidents, but for the most part, they're staying out of it. So again, that, that sort of puts a lot more pressure on Hamas once we get to the aftermath of this particular operation. All right, well, my final question, because unfortunately we're running uh, low on time for this first topic, but my final question is, you know, Naftali Bennett uh, of the Jewish Home was just, or not of the Jewish Home anymore, of Haimina Khadash, yes, I'm sorry, I misspoke, has just been uh, appointed, uh, well, he just stepped into his role as defense minister today. What a day to start. Uh, do you think that he will... What, what do you think his policy will be continuing forward? Uh, okay, so my, my view is I think Naftali Bennett was one of the few effective ministers in the last government. You know, as, as, edu as, as education as, minister. Education, I think he was a great education minister. He should have stayed as education minister. The very mm -hmm. idea of firing him, I mean, it's just how political all this is. He was fired as education minister for political reasons. Now he's defense minister for political reasons. It's an absurd situation that doesn't only relate sure. to this government. Our governments in this country are too much based on politics. It, takes, it generally says it takes one year to be able to do a job well, to start learning the job and knowing what to do. And that level, it's absurd. So you know, he's not going to have the time. Uh, uh, I know Naftali for now uh, seven, eight years. I am going to sleep much better tonight knowing that Naftali Bennett is defense minister. I think when you look at his record within the security cabinet, what he did with the terror tunnels, the fact that he was willing to challenge the establishment and make sure that they were on the right course, that is the type of defense minister you want especially when we're looking at the great strategic threats that we're going to be dealing with in the upcoming weeks. All right, well, now it's time to move on. Thank you for that. Now, meanwhile, in light of the security situation, the Blue and White Party has canceled and rescheduled its ongoing coalition negotiations for tomorrow, including a meeting actually set for today between party chairman Benny Gantz and Israel Beitenu head Avigdor Lieberman. But in even bigger news regarding the coalition talks, Gantz and Prime Minister Netanyahu are reportedly inching closer to closing a unity deal. And according to party statements, the proposal brought forward by the Likud would involve a rotating prime minister position. Netanyahu would continue on for the first year, stepping down in favor of Gantz for the remaining three years. And Netanyahu would then agree to step down earlier in the event of a criminal trial against him. So uh, my first question is, I'll go back to you, Jeremy. You know, this is very similar to Rivlin's plan, which Netanyahu and the Likud actually accepted back in September and Gantz shut down. Why should we expect anything different uh, today, if, if at all? 
Look, I, I'd love to be optimistic and hopeful. Uh, as you said, it, it really is the president's uh, outline. It's maybe presented, it's presented as perhaps something else, but it's the president's outline. Uh, we've talked about this over and over, over again. Gantz could have agreed to this back when Netanyahu had the mandate. Gantz could have agreed to this when he got the mandate. Look, we're eight days before the end of the mandate for Gantz, and he knows the third mandate is coming up. He sees that he has no other real option but to compromise. I hope that he does, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not so sure that he will. But I really hope that he does. If there's one thing that we can all agree on, especially when we're looking at the events of today, there are many reasons to have a national unity government. When we're looking at the current security situation, what we need is stability. And we do not need a third election. And it's time for him to come down from a lot of his, you know, I, ta I called it the three no's last time I was here, right? He needs to decide that he's going to say yes to Bibi, yes to um, the right-wing parties, yes to the Haredim. Because if not, I, I mean, what, what really is his alternative? To sit now with their parties? I mean, really? Well, there are reports that he's actually, at the same time, speaking with, uh, with the Arab parties uh, to form some sort of minority unity government, as it's been called. And Avigdor Lieberman has given his own little ultimatum, saying, you know, form a unity or else I'll go with whoever is closest. So there's no question in my mind that he would go with Lieberman's plan. And let, in other words, let, in other words, there's no question he'll go with Lieberman's plan, which is to let Netanyahu go first, but to um, eject the religious parties as, as part of the group. There's no question he'll go for that. The big question in my mind is, will he go for, I almost see him going with the government with, with the Haredim, possibly, but will he go with the government with, with Bitsala Smutrich in his part of that government? That pushes the ability of Gantz, I think, a little bit too far. I you think, think, you think Smutrich is, is the most Smutrich you know, is, is the most extreme, yeah, absolutely the most extreme voice, because he's, he's a dual extremist. He's an extremist on religious matters and understands something. His extremism on religious matters is more troubling to most Israelis when they think about it than the Haredim who just want to be left alone and get the money. You know, so, Gantz sat last week with Ayman Oda and Ahmed Tibi for coalition negotiation. One of the things that, that just yesterday we were hearing in Nissan Horowitz, who's the head of uh, Merits in the Democratic Union, yeah. went ahead and pushed this narrative also that they're moving forward on this idea of a minority government. And with again, their, we're, we're with seeing their with, with their parties. And, and again, we, we see what's happening today. We see the remarks coming from members of the Joint Arab List in which they are denouncing the act of the government, the act of the army. And they, again, they, they only Gans, said it was, they said it was politically motivated. Former, it's, it's, they didn't, it's they didn't former, attack the army this time. They, know, only, they, only motive, they only said that it was politically motivated. If you're timing. looking at the leaders, yeah, but if you look further down the list, you can go through their Twitter and you can see that a few of them did mention the IDF. But again, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's the leaders or it's the MKs that are lower down on the list. Benny Gantz is a former IDF chief of staff. He can't go ahead and say that he's going to really think that it makes more sense to him to have a minority government with the joint Arab list over going ahead and having a unity government with the right wing. But, and yes, that but that's assuming perhaps that those are the people. only two options. Can right now we have another option, which is a third election, yes. that I think most well, Israelis agree mandate. we cannot afford. I, the third, I, I there's I a third mandate there. as well, but we have yes. no idea what's going on with that. We don't even know who, who is likely to be appointed to take that third mandate. That's true. Should there be one? No one's appointed. Point. They have to, someone has to come you, forth you need, and grab the mandate, so to right, speak. Right, right. You have mm -hmm. to get 61 signatures, and you have 21 days to do so. Afterwards, the president has two days to, to verify the signatures. Then that person gets 14 days to, to form a government. But, you know, that's just the way that we have. We might not know until the first week of January if we are going to elections or we have a new oh, government. Wow. But what we do need to keep in mind here is that if we do have this minority government, uh, basic law, the Knesset, Clause 36A says, if you do not have a state budget passed by March 31st, that will trigger automatic elections. So this idea of having a minority Wait, government... They don't, they don't take the budget from the previous year? I thought that budget you, rolls you, over. You no, that, that's what happens now. You can have the rollover for up to if, three months. If we, don't have, if we have new elections, that's what's going to happen. We'll have a rollover and we'll have one twelfth of the, um, of the budget, and that's when we really start feeling the problem of not having a government. In other words, for better or for worse, and at the time I thought it was for worse because I didn't anticipate this, the Netanyahu government passed a two-year budget, which I don't believe in. Well, the 2019 yeah. budget was actually individual after the two-year budget, but they, they passed it almost a year right. early because right. we, we envisioned mm -hmm. that we might have some issues. Of course, we never envisioned two the, elections <laughs> in 2019. <laughs> But, but we did go ahead, and, and I think so, it was in March or April of 2018. You're saying that we have, that we have another deadline, and that's the budget. And that's the budget. Well, the budget will start, March, it'll start, it'll start hitting because at that point, every, every ministry gets 
exactly one twelfth of what they got the year before. And that, number one, there's been inflation, there's been all sorts of issues, things mm -hmm. have changed, and suddenly it's really going to start hurting. Until now, we've had working but, but, under but a budget. Again, the, the important issue here is that if, uh, if we're talking about elections in either March or April, which is what would happen if we don't form a government now, if we have a minority government, then we'll just have an election two months later in June. So, you know. Do you it, agree? You think the no, minority I, government no, I, 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 will I, fall apart? In the I know, well, first of all, there's nothing that says that this minority government is part of the coalition agreement so the minority government can't pass a, can't pass a budget right away. You, you, need a, you need to pass a budget. You can pass though. a budget, though. You can, you're you're going to have 55 votes against that budget. But you still, yeah, that, that's you, still you're going to need to figure out a way to get 56 votes yes, you still have when 50, you, have a, you have a government of 44 people. But you still can't so have 56. You can have a, you know, yeah, but you, one you, of those supply you, you can have the same group of people that agrees to support a minority government can also agree to pass, pass a budget right away before any I, arguments take I, place. I don't see the joint oh, list on. and Yisrael Beitenu both agreeing outside of the coalition to both have well, a confidence vote and also pass a stat, state right. budget. Well, we're certainly going to have going to find out uh, in the near future, yeah. for better or worse. Uh, but moving on to the third topic, for over a year, Israeli companies operating in the disputed territories have been in limbo, waiting for the European Union's High Court of Justice to rule on the labeling laws for their goods. Well, on Tuesday, the court finally released its decision, and it's official. Israeli companies working in East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and in the Golan must now label their exports to Europe as coming from occupied territories. Israeli officials, advocacy groups, and companies like the Psagot Winery argue, however, that the law is discriminatory and facilitates anti-Semitic boycotts, such as the BDS movement. Uh, Mark, do you agree? What, what are your initial t uh, Okay, so I, I have a dual take. I'm, I'm against the decision. That's number one. I just think it's a bad decision. I don't think it... I mean, I'm not, I'm not up on the legality of it, but I think it's a bad decision. On the other hand, it should be an anticipated decision. We, we need to understand two things. Whether you're in favor or against the areas, the disputed territories, the whatever you want to define them as, legally, by international law, they're not part of the state of Israel. So legally, people can make decisions in any which way they want. And, we, and I think we're always making a mistake by sort of saying, well, BDS, if you BDS the territories, that's the same thing as BDSing Israel. And that's not the same thing. We need to keep that in mind. Whether you, you know, whatever your views are on the territories, they are not legally the same thing as the state of Israel within the within the Green Line. The state of Israel within the Green Line is recognized in borders in a recognized state. Beyond the Green Line, it's disputed. We can argue what the this future is should in be. East Jerusalem as well. By Israel, the way, according, right, to by according to the rest of the world. I mean, we have our own views, which is fine. Well, I mean, the United States and you know. The United States. Uh, okay, whatever. And, but the, by international know, law, yeah, it, it's 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 disputed. Let's put it that way. Disputed, and, I'll I'll give you. So, well, so, yeah, look, I mean, look I, I mean, Israelis are in the bomb shelter, and, and Europe is deciding to go ahead and, and go forth with this law. It's, it, it's a little puzzling. You'd think at least they'd push it off a day uh, instead of trying to have this in, in the same paper. Um, so, so that's crazy. Uh, I was reading the, the actual decision, the language. They, they claim yeah, they, that, they that go on. They want to give consumers the ethical... Choice. Uh, choice. Yes, I, I mean, there are a lot of things to pick apart, but the thing that particularly, you know, for me, uh, I'm looking at it, my eyes just got really, really large. They, they talk about the Golan Heights being owned by Syria, the, the Syrian Arab Republic, they actually referred it to in the actual wording. And, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, does anybody actually believe that the Golan belongs to Syria anymore? But we, but we never is, even, that, is that but, like... But, but we, we never even annexed That's not it. even disputed. But, that but, but, but is we, taking a position... But, but we've, never, we've never actually annexed it legally. We, we, we we've put we've our applied law, sovereignty. We've applied our law to it. We, but we've we did applied not, sovereignty. There's a difference even, though, legally. Even if we've not annexed it, right, we've so, applied so, so, sovereignty. We've applied, we've applied our laws so, to it. So we ourselves never said it's actually physically part of the state of Israel. We've said we were applying our laws to it. Now, again, these are legal decisions. There, not, there, are, there are various maps going around as the global powers try to cut up Syria into a bunch of different pieces. The thought that that the Golan would end up back in, I don't in Assad that. or someone else's hands. But but I'm saying this is again this this is a prejudice which, which is an issue. It's not quite a disputed. It's not saying anything else. It is saying that specifically that Golan the Golan is owned by Assad. That is what but the, this the, statement but the, but the, but is coming the, the, out the, the, and saying. The, the, the and is, that is ludicrous considering the sanctions the EU has. On Assad but the problem and is that, Syria. The problem is that legally, actually, it's more true than saying that the West Bank belongs to somebody else. The Again, West Bank, the West Bank no is reason, gray. There's no uh, reason. There's no reason in this language to put stuff in there. Uh, there's a reason why, again, you have people who, who are concerned about the BDS. 
noting that they're using BDS language when it comes to Judea and Samaria well, so and Eastern Jerusalem. But, but I'm saying, let's go to an easier case of the Golan to just say, this is, this is a very, very well, so puzzling document, both in the timing and in the content and in the rhetoric. Well, so, so let's move on now kind of towards the, the proactive. What can Israel do, if anything, to maybe combat or respond to this ruling? So, th so there's a few things you can do. One is you can go to the member states, and you can ask the member the, states this, not this to comply. This ruling is from the now, EU's now high again, court. You are correct. This is from the EU high court. You're asking what tools do you have in the diplomatic toolbox of you know the Israeli foreign ministry or whatever four or five ministries are dealing with the foreign yeah. affairs at, at the moment. Uh, what is it that they can do? So one of the things they can do is you can make that ask. You can go ahead, at, you know, the easiest would obviously be with the UK, right? With the whole Brexit right, but business. Would they be, but would but they be legally allowed to listen so, to that so, act? So there, have, there, there has been cases where we've seen selective enforcement of the decisions that were made by the EU courts. This could be another one of those things that is just selectively I mean, enforced. The difference, though, is that before, until so, now, so, it was so again, a directorate, you know, whereas now it's... A hundred percent. Wait, wait, wait. wait. First of all, we made a mistake. Whoever bought the legal case made a mistake. That, that was so go. Yeah, it was yeah. a really mistake, to say the least. Number two, let's keep in mind that probably, and I don't have an exact figure, but my guess is the exports that this represents, you know, altogether Israeli exports is probably 0.01 percent of all Israeli exports. So I understand the, the reason for being right. worried about the, the precedent, et cetera, but it's really not a significant amount of our exports in other words, the um, amount of our exports that are produced in the West Bank and, Go and the Golan Heights and the amount that go to the EU, it's just well, a so what are, so, so does it not matter to the economy at large? The economy makes no difference to it. It makes a difference well, to some individual uh, companies, look, obviously. It's, you know, yeah. if you're looking at the national economy, so, so it's not a very big indication. But again, yeah, you have the legal president's issue, which is an issue. But beyond that, you, you have specific markets. Uh, if you look at the Israeli date market, the Israeli fig market, okay? Th this is pretty much all, j just about 100%, you know, over 90% yeah. is stuff coming from the Jordan Valley, the northern Dead Sea area. And very interestingly, if you look at Europe, the majority of the, of the imports that they have when it comes to figs and dates and a lot of these other issues yeah, are from the settlements, meaning they're going to be shooting themselves in the foot. These are things that are now going to go up and skyrocket in price in Europe. All right, well, I guess we'll, we'll have to find out uh, kind of what happens in the aftermath of this ruling uh, and how, how big the effect actually is uh, in, the, in the actuality. Uh, but unfortunately, that's all the time that we have in the elections arena today. I'd like to thank Jeremy Saltan and Mark Schulman for joining us. And of course, thanks to all of you who are tuning in. For more news from ILTV, remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next time.